Good evening. Welcome to another session of the Comfort Verses in Context. For the past weeks, we had been looking at and seeing from scriptures what an ordinance is and whether the Baptist distinctives to ordinances, namely the Lord's Supper and Baptism, are indeed Pauline ordinances that ought to be observed in this dispensation of grace. Last week, we learned about the Lord's Supper and whether it is a Pauline ordinance. Tonight, we're going to focus on the second ordinance of the Baptist distinctive, which is baptism. The question that we pose tonight is whether baptism is a Pauline ordinance. Our prayer for you tonight is that you would consider the truths that are presented this evening, not simply as it attacks tradition, no, but rather that we can see what Scripture says, that we can reevaluate our traditions and purpose when it comes to baptism in the church, which is the body of Christ in this dispensation of grace. So tonight, before we study, let us first come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that we can study your word and we thank you that indeed we have an authority that we can rest when it comes to your word. And tonight, Father, I pray that your spirit of wisdom and revelation would enlighten the eyes of our understanding. Help us not to resist the truth, but rather let the truth of your word govern our mind and our hearts as to what we ought to need, need to do. Tonight, Father, as we look into your word, do guide us into all the truth. Help us to see the things you want us to see. And the truths that we receive this evening, let it simply burn in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, our session this evening is entitled, Is Baptism a Pauline Ordinance? Last week, we looked at the definition of the ordinance as it is used in the scriptures. We see that an ordinance is any given rule by an authority to a specific agent, uh, to a specific recipient to establish order. By that definition of an ordinance, we realize this simple truth that an ordinance is spokesperson and audience specific. One ordinance that is given to one audience for a particular situation through a specific spokesperson cannot be applied to another. Having said this, we know the importance now of a Pauline ordinance and we keep the ordinances delivered by our Apostle Paul because, number one, the Apostle Paul is the Apostle of the Gentiles. That's in Romans chapter 11, verse 13, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7, and 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 11. This is very significant because you and I, my friends, we are Gentiles. We also keep the ordinances delivered by our Apostle Paul because the Apostle Paul is the spokesperson of God for this dispensation of grace. Not only is the Apostle Paul our Apostle, he's also the spokesperson for this dispensation of grace. And in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul clearly declared that God has given him the dispensation of the grace of God. And because of this, we read the truth that Apostle Paul declared, saying, if any man think himself to be a prophet, that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number 37, or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Do we want to know the commandments of the Lord for our dispensation of grace today? Those are the things that Paul had written. And because of this, 
The Apostle Paul also said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 2, Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Last week, we have established the following things. Number one, that the Lord's Supper is a unique and distinct ordinance by the Apostle Paul for us in this dispensation of grace, different from the Lord's Supper of the Twelve Apostles. We have to understand that the Twelve Apostles performed the Lord's Supper in their church, in the Kingdom Church, in order to look forward to the coming Kingdom of the Christ. Whereas, in this dispensation of grace, the Lord's Supper is performed by the church which is the body of Christ in remembrance of the finished work of Jesus Christ in His death for our sins, burial, and resurrection. Lord's Supper, according to the Pauline distinctive, remembers the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is according to the gospel of the grace of God. Thus, we resolve that the church, which is the body of Christ, in this dispensation of grace, ought to observe the Lord's Supper, showing the Lord's death until He comes. Now tonight, we go to the second ordinance, which is baptism. And let's dive into some preliminaries of the word baptism, starting with its definition. The Noah Webster Dictionary defines baptism as the application of water to a person as a sacrament or religious ceremony by which he is initiated into the visible church of Christ. This is usually performed by sprinkling or immersion. This definition is showing us that this is what baptism is made presently. It's made a sacrament. It's made a religious ceremony or a rite, and it serves as an initiation into the visible church. That is why many had just thought of baptism as a religious program, an activity that is a church activity, and it is the means by which a person is made a member of the local church. Now, we want you to hold on to that definition because we would see how far how the world defines baptism today to what the scriptures show what Pauline baptism is actually about. Now, we'll go to the etymology of the word baptism, which again shows another redefinition in the 1300s, which is an initiatory sacrament of the Christian faith, consisting in immersion or application of water by an authorized administrator. Sounds like many religions and traditions today, not only for the Baptists, but even the Roman Catholics the, the, and other religions as well. But the root word is the Old French baptisme or baptism and the Latin baptismus or the Greek baptis, baptismos, which is the noun of action from the word baptize. Now, essentially, the word baptism and its related forms is basically a transliteration of the Greek word. So it's irrelevant that you would go to the Greek and say this comes from the Greek word baptizo when the word baptism itself is a transliteration of the Greek. Now we have to understand now that a word is not simply defined by its lexical definition but also how it occurs in scriptures and how it is used. Now, the word baptism and its related forms occur a total of 111 times in the scriptures. And here's an amazing part. It appears zero times in the Old Testament and all of the occurrences are in the New Testament. Now, let me digress a bit and we would like to let everyone know that we reject the error that the Old Testament washings, referring to the washing of the priests and the washing of purifications of Israel, are the baptisms in Old Testament time. The 
truth is, there is no linguistic nor textual basis for such an assertion. It is presumptive to say the least. One of the ultimate proofs of how washing or washings in the Old Testament is never viewed as a, as a baptism is not only do no New Testament writer refer to the washings of the Levitical priesthood and the washings of Israel as baptisms, but also the Septuagint never renders the word washings in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers as baptismos, but rather different words that mean washing. Therefore, the washing in the Old Testament will always remain washing in the Old Testament. It's not baptism. It is washing in the Old Testament. And that shows us clearly that all occurrences of the word baptism are in the New Testament. For more information, you can check out the work of Dr. Dave Rees that talks about the King James, uh, God's dictionary in the King James Bible. And there he would deal with great detail how washing and baptisms are used appropriately in the King James Bible. Now, we continue with our uh, study, all occurrences of the word baptism in its related forms are in the New Testament. 65 times it occurs in the Gospels. Now, this shows us that majority of the times that baptism is emphasized, it's in the Gospels. 29 times in the book of Acts, 16 times in the Pauline epistles, and only one time in the Hebrew general epistles. Now, of the 111 times that the word baptism and its related forms occur in the scriptures, there were two baptisms there that refer to Old Testament references to baptism, none of which would refer to the Levitical washings. The first one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 2, where Stephen, in his sermon, said, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, this event is talking about Israel's passing under the cloud through the Red Sea when Israel was delivered from Egypt on the way to the Promised Land. Now, this, would, this occurrence would show us that Stephen calls that statement, that work, that event that happened in Exodus, a baptism, but it is not the washing, rather, it is not the washing in the Levitical priesthood, but rather, it's Israel's crossing of the Red Sea. Now, this will also set the definition of the word baptism, that it's not necessarily immersion. Do not make the mistake of correcting the Word of God by adding immersion automatically to the word baptized. Now, they may say, well, the Greek word is baptizo, which means to immerse. No, that is not true. The, bap the word baptismo simply means baptized. So, if this is baptism, then how is it that when Israel crossed through the Red Sea, they were dry? They went through the sea, not under the sea, right? And, the ones that were actually immersed in the Red Sea are the Egyptian armies that all died. Therefore, baptism is not automatic for immersion. This is the first occurrence of a baptism that refers to an Old Testament one. The second one is in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 20, where Peter writes his audience saying, Which sometime were disobedient? When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, was up preparing, were in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. They were saved by water. And now Peter makes a conjecture there saying, The like figure were unto even baptism doth also now save us. 
not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, baptism for Peter and his audience is plainly taught teaching that it's able to save. By this, we are already able to determine key distinctives of what was called by the New Testament writers as baptism in the Old Testament, which makes it unique and distinct from the baptism for the church, which is the body of Christ. Now, how are they different? Number one, to whom they were baptized unto is different. Remember, in 1 Corinthians 10 verse number 2, Israel in the wilderness were baptized unto Moses. It's different. Israel, when crossing through the Red Sea, were baptized unto Moses. But for the church, which is the body of Christ, we are baptized into one body. You can read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 13, where Paul writes, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. The direction of the baptism is different. Israel was baptized unto Moses, but the church which is the body of Christ was baptized to and to into Jesus Christ, into one body. Now, we also see that that the, not only are they different with to whom they were baptized unto, but we also see that the, church, the body is the church, which is the body of Christ. So they're baptized into one body, that one body is the church, which is the body of Christ. That is seen in Colossians chapter 1, verse number 18, where Paul says, And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that, and that in all things he might have the preeminence. Therefore, the object of baptism is different. Israel was baptized unto Moses. We are baptized into one body, which is the church, which is the body of Christ. Not only that, but we also see that in the Old Testament references to baptism in the New Testament, baptism as a means of salvation is unique and distinct for Israel's dispensation than for the church which is the body of Christ. Remember, Peter said that baptism doth also now save us. And he pertains to Israel in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. But Paul made it very clear that the church which is the body of Christ is saved by grace and not of works. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 makes it very clear. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Baptism is a work. If baptism saves us in this dispensation of grace, then Paul was lying. We are not saved by grace. But we see that the baptism referred to by the New Testament writers for the Old Testament references is unique and distinct from the baptism which is in our dispensation of grace today. Now, for Peter's audience, Israel, in their dispensation, baptism saves. Now, this is a quandary for many because if there's only one way to be saved, from Genesis to Revelation, then how did Peter and why did Peter say that baptism saves? No wonder we would read about baptism in the Gospels as one that can wash away sins and that we would see that it's called the baptism of repentance of John for the, repentant, for the remission of sins. Remember in Mark chapter 1, verse 4, 
Mark records saying, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So you see, John's baptism being unique and distinct was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. The truth is, this actually fulfills prophecy. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 to 6, the prophet Malachi declared, declared for God, saying, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I smite the earth with a curse. Now, this is recognized as fulfilled in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, where Luke records saying, And he shall go, speaking of John the Baptist, he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. That's basically Elijah as well. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the, to, uh, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now we also see John's commission to baptize, which is the purpose by which he was sent. We read in John chapter 1, verse 18 to 31, John records saying, These things were done at Bethabara beyond Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John see it Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, I am come baptizing with water. So what does it show us? Here's the truth. John the Baptist was sent to baptize in order to reveal Christ and to prepare the people of Israel for their Christ. Take note of this. John was sent to baptize. He was sent to baptize for the, remi for the repentance, for the remission of sins, to prepare the people for their Christ and to reveal the Christ. Now, same baptism of John, the same baptism of John was performed also by the apostles, which brings us to the next occurrence of the word baptism in the Gospels, which is that the 12 apostles were sent by the Lord Jesus to preach the gospel and to baptize for salvation. Remember what Peter said in his epistle? Baptism doth now save us. Does baptism save? For Israel in their dispensation, yes! That's why baptism was very important for Israel's dispensations. We read this in Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 16, where Mark records saying, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth, and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be condemned. Here's the picture. Baptism saves for Israel in their dispensation according to their spokespersons. No wonder when Peter preached to Israel in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, we read these words. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Baptism saves for Israel's dispensation. Baptism washes away sins. But let me be very clear. For Israel's dispensations. Hence, we see established the key distinctives of the baptism in the Gospels for Israel from the church which is the body of Christ. Number one, baptism cleanses away sins. 
Mark 1, 4, and Acts chapter 2, verse 38 asserts that. But know this, in this dispensation of grace, we are cleansed not by the water of baptism, but rather by the blood of Christ, as it is written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. It's not water that cleanses us. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. This is said also in Colossians chapter 1, verse number 14, where Paul also writes, saying, In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. It's the blood, not the waters of baptism, that saves and cleanses and justifies the believer in this dispensation of grace. Therefore, baptism in our dispensation is not a means to be saved. It's not even a proof of salvation. It has nothing to do with salvation. That's an important distinctive to remember. And not only that, baptism saves according to Mark chapter 16, verse 15 to 16. But in this dispensation of grace, we are saved not by our good works, but according to God's purpose and grace. This is clearly stated in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, where Paul says, Who had saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Now, here's the truth we want to see. Baptism, by Old Testament references of the New Testament writers and in the Gospels, is unique and distinct for Israel in their dispensation. Therefore, the church which is the body of Christ ought to be aware to be baptizing like these Old Testament references, like these Old Testament concepts, like these concepts in the Gospels where it washes away sins, where it saves, or it's unto a person. Because we can deduce the following things. First, John the Baptist was sent to baptize in order to reveal Christ and to prepare the people of Israel for their Christ. The twelve apostles were sent to baptize for Israel to be saved and for the remission of their sins. Notice the pattern. John the Baptist was sent to baptize. The twelve apostles were sent to baptize. That is why baptism for Israel's dispensation is a major thing. But here's a question we want to ask tonight, and we want to be very honest. Was Paul sent to baptize? The answer to which would show us whether our apostle and spokesperson in this dispensation of grace was sent to baptize, and if he is sent to baptize, then it is in effect also sending us to baptize as well. Now, in that regard, the scripture answers it very clearly, where Paul writes, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. My friends, baptism is unique and distinct for the church, which is the body of Christ, in this dispensation of grace. Because baptism, for us, is not the work of man. It's rather the work of the Godhead that actually is performed the moment we trust in the sufficiency of the finished work of Christ. You can see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 30, where Paul says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Do notice this. The church, which is the body of Christ, is baptized by the spirit, not by man. John the Baptist baptized Israel 
It's a man baptizing his fellow man. The twelve apostles baptized Israel for the remission of their sins and for their salvation. But man baptizing man. But in our dispensation of grace, it's the Spirit, not man, that performs our baptism. The church, which is the body of Christ, is baptized by the Spirit and not man. And therefore, this shows us that this is a spiritual baptism and not a physical baptism. And not only that, we read in Galatians chapter 3, verse number 27, Paul says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. An important distinction that we have to know is that church, which is the body of Christ, is baptized by the Spirit and not man. And the church, which is the body of Christ, is baptized into Christ and not into man. Israel was baptized into Moses. But the church, which is the body of Christ, is baptized into Christ. We have to be very careful about this because our baptism is not into man, into a religion, into a denomination. That is why we have to be very careful in how the word baptism in the scripture had been turned into something of a simple religious activity rather than the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the work of the Spirit. It is a spiritual baptism not a physical one. Now, what exactly does it mean that the believer is baptized into Christ? Paul shows the detailed meaning in Romans chapter 6, verse 34, of 3 to 4, where Paul says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, that's the baptism into Christ, were baptized into, into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The Spirit baptizes us into Christ. The Spirit baptizes us into the death of Christ, his burial, and his resurrection. This is mentioned again in Colossians chapter 2, verse number 12, where Paul says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein, ye, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Now this shows us that baptism that is unique and distinct for the church which is the body of Christ in this dispensation of grace is a baptism that is the conformity to the death of Christ for our sins, burial, and resurrection. I pray that this distinction will not be lost. We are baptized not to wash away sins, not to be a physical member of a local church. We are baptized by the Spirit in order to conform us into the death of Christ for our sins, burial, and resurrection. And I want us to make this connection that the conformity by the Spirit baptizing us into Christ to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is, in simple and sum summative terms, the gospel of our salvation contained in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 4, where Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Thus, we can see the following deductions. Number one, baptism pertaining to Israel's dispensation is a baptism unto man 
for the remission of sins and salvation. We are baptized not the same way Israel was baptized. Because of this, baptism pertaining to Israel's dispensation is inapplicable for the church, which is the body of Christ, in this dispensation of grace. Simply because the nature of these baptisms are different. Israel has a physical baptism. The church, which is the body of Christ, has a spiritual baptism. Baptism for the church, which is the body of Christ, in this dispensation of grace, is unique and distinct from Israel's baptism by their spokesperson and their dispensation. And we would see that this baptism for the church, which is the body of Christ, is a spiritual baptism performed by the Spirit, baptizing believers into Christ, into His body, conforming us to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Therefore, physical baptism is not the main thing or of ultimate importance in this dispensation of grace. Remember, the Apostle Paul wrote, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Here's a simple truth. One baptism that matters in this dispensation of grace is the baptism by the Spirit into the body of Christ that takes place the moment a person trusts in Christ, believing the sufficiency of his death for our sins, burial, and resurrection. Now, if there's one baptism that matters in this dispensation of grace, let me propound the problem, which is, didn't Paul baptize? Huh. Now, truth is, the verse preceding 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, where Paul was not sent to baptize, sent this, I thank God that I baptize none of you but Crispus and Gaius lest anyone any should say that I have baptized in my own name, and I baptize also the household of Stephanas. Besides, besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Now, Paul was not sent to baptize, yet Paul did baptize. Was this a contradiction? Scriptures cannot contradict itself, my friends. Is this an evidence of progressive revelation where Paul received a message to stop baptizing after he performed baptism? No, that is actually, that is actually unwarranted and assumptive. But here is something that we clearly know. Physical baptism in this dispensation of grace is not the main thing. Let me say that again. Physical baptism in this dispensation of grace is not the main thing. If you don't get physically baptized, but you have trusted in the sufficiency of the finished work of Christ, you are made part of the body of Christ, whether you had the water baptism or not. Physical baptism in this dispensation of grace is not the main thing. As a matter of fact, this division is the actual disorder that Paul was addressing in Corinth when he talked about baptism. Now let's look at the preceding verses, which starts in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 10, where Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, and that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, Paul exhorts them to be in unity in the Spirit, to speak the same thing, to think, to have the same mind, and to be same 
in judgment. Now, how did Paul address the disorder of divisions in Corinth? Paul expounds what it's about. In verses 11 to 12, Paul says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Now, this speaks about following Peter, Paul, Apollos, or Christ, following personalities. Paul contends with that division and says in 1 Corinthians 1.13, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? This is tantamount to Paul saying, Is there more than one head? Is there more than one body? Was Paul crucified for them? Was it the Apostle Paul who died for their sins, was buried, and on the third day rose again? And were they baptized in Paul's name? Absolutely not. Paul did baptize a few, as we can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse number, uh, four, uh, chapter 1, verse 14 to 16, where he said that he baptized Crispus, Gaius, the house of the Stephanas in Corinth. Okay? But that's not the main thing. What's the main thing? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. The main thing is not the physical baptism. The main thing is to preach the gospel. Now, why is this the main thing? Because I want you to see and make the connection that the gospel Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians 1 is revealed fully in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 to 4, which I mentioned to you a while ago, where Paul speaks about the gospel which he preached unto them, which by which they are saved, and which we are saved as well. And this is something that declares how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, why is this the main thing? Because this is the gospel that man hears and by which he trusts in Christ, believing the sufficiency of Christ's death for our sins, his burial, and his resurrection. Man hears the gospel, he trusts in Christ, believing the sufficiency of the finished work of Christ. The moment he does so, Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. When we are sealed with that Spirit, we receive that Spirit. The moment we receive that Spirit, the same Spirit, baptizes us into Christ. The main thing is not water baptism that cannot save. The main thing is preaching the gospel by which a person who trusts in the sufficiency of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection can be baptized into Christ, into His body, by the Spirit, with the baptism that is not of man, but a spiritual baptism. That's the main thing. Now, here's another thing. Notice that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 to 4, Paul made it clear, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So remember, Paul says, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Now, I want you to make the connection with what Paul talked about the ordinances, okay? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 2, Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, 
and keep the ordinances as I deliver them to you. Now, here's a connection we want to see. Baptism for the church, which is the body of Christ, is a baptism performed by the Spirit, baptizing us into Christ, into His body, and conforming us to the death of Christ for our sins, burial, and resurrection. Now, Paul admonishes that the gospel of our salvation, which is, again, the death of Christ for our sins, burial, and resurrection, be kept in memory. Now, here's my proposal. Wouldn't baptism by immersion demonstrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the believer's conformity to Christ's death for our sins, burial, and resurrection? Now, we would see, therefore, that Paul was not sent to baptize, but still baptized as a demonstration of the believer's conformity to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the gospel of the grace of God. And once again, baptism, physical baptism, is not the main thing. It's the gospel. It is the gospel that is being demonstrated by the act of water baptism. Now, here's a problem. Some would say, now wouldn't this make the preaching of the cross of none effect? Now, we go back to our passage where Paul says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Now, many would use this verse and say, if you baptize in this dispensation of grace, you make the cross of Christ of none effect. But that exactly is simply nothing but wisdom of words. Why? If we would analyze our passage carefully, paying attention to what the scripture actually says, you would notice that there are two verb clauses here that are infinitives. Okay? The first is like a prohibition, a negative statement, which is, for Christ sent me not to baptize. So it's a negative proposition. And notice now that this negative proposition or negative statement is separated to the positive statement to preach the gospel by a comma separating that clause from the rest of the clause and connected by an adversative conjunction, but this makes it a disjunct, you see? Negative statement, Christ sent me not to baptize. Positive statement, but to preach the gospel. And how do you preach the gospel? Notice the colon. It explains the, the verb clause further where Paul says, you preach the gospel not with wisdom of words. That's the picture. And again, another comma that would describe the warning if you preach the gospel with wisdom of words, that Paul says, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So, this answers the question, would it make the cross of Christ of none effect if we baptize by water today? No, the truth is this. It is not baptism that makes the cross of Christ of none effect, but rather the preaching the gospel with wisdom of words. But here's also another truth. Baptism by immersion can effectively demonstrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the believer's conformity to Christ's death for our sins, burial, and resurrection. Because inasmuch as Paul was not sent to baptize, he baptized, and we would see that Paul baptized even though he was not sent to baptize, because although baptism is not the main thing, it can be a means to communicate the message. So here's an important question. Is baptism a Pauline ordinance? Here are my answers. Paul was not sent to baptize. Therefore, we are not sent to baptize as well. 
because baptism is not the main thing. Paul's ordinance is to keep in memory the gospel message, which is the declaration of Christ's death for our sins, burial, and resurrection. Therefore, we see also that baptism by immersion can effectively demonstrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ according to the gospel of the grace of God as well as the believer's conformity to it. Therefore, we can conclude that baptism is not a Pauline ordinance but a means to keep a Pauline ordinance to keep in memory the death, burial, the death of Christ for our sins, burial, and resurrection according to the gospel of our salvation. And remember, yes, Paul was not sent to baptize, but Paul did baptize. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Paul says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Paul was not sent to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So are we. Paul did baptize. So we do follow him, taking care that the baptism that we perform is illustrative of Christ's death for our sins, burial, and resurrection according to the gospel of our salvation. My friends and pastors that are listening to this broadcast tonight, baptism is not the main thing. And let us stop making it the main thing. The sad thing is, pastors today would measure their church by amounts of baptisms. But that's simply misconstrued as thinking that your membership grows by what you do rather than what the word what, what, rather than the spirit baptizing a person into the body of Christ the moment they trust in the finished work of Christ let's stop making baptism the main thing but rather we ought to consider carefully baptism as our tradition and in our purpose. Consider, what are our traditions when it comes to baptism? Does it facilitate the demonstration of the gospel message proclaiming the death of Christ for our sins, burial, and resurrection? Is such a message still emphasized and ingrained to those that we baptize? Is it clearly understood in our churches today? Or maybe baptism had become a rite of passage, much like the circumcision in the Old Testament, much like the circumcision in the time of Christ, and much like the circumcision in Paul's time, which is bondage in this dispensation of grace. Has our baptism still remained faithful to the Pauline truth that it reflects it demonstrates the death of Christ for our sins, burial, and resurrection? Or are the people baptized with the mindset that their sins are washed away? Oh, my friends, we have to check our traditions. We have to also see whether our tradition of baptism had become restrictive, limiting the observance of an act Pauline ordinance of the Lord's Supper when we leg legalistically require water baptism to partake in the Lord's Supper. Remember, the Lord's Supper is an ordinance. It is a call of the Apostle Paul to remember the finished work of Christ. If water baptism is not the main thing, why is it a requirement to partake the Lord's Supper. If baptism doesn't wash away sins and we are forgiven all trespasses the moment we trust in Christ, why restrict? Would it be more divisive when it comes to that? Would it be a divisive tradition when it comes to your baptism? Setting up privilege and status 
for some to minister and some to exercise their gifts in the body of Christ, requiring water baptism to perform such. If water baptism is not the main thing, then once a, a person believes in the sufficiency of the finished work of Christ, he's already part of the body of Christ. He's a member of the body of Christ. Why prevent him from exercising his gifts? Wouldn't this tradition simply be bondage rooted in the misunderstanding of what Paul's baptism is actually about? And we need to revisit our purpose why we baptize. Does it still remember the gospel? Does it demonstrate the gospel? Does it declare Christ's death for our sins, burial, and resurrection? Or has it become a means by which people can take pride and say, I am saved because I am baptized? My friends, baptism is not the main thing. Let us consider indeed the way that we do baptism, whether we are still following Paul or we have fallen to follow the traditions of men. Our prayer for you tonight is that you would consider these things as it has been presented and let every man be persuaded in his own mind. Consider these things. The Lord give you understanding in all things. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray that the truths that we have heard would make us reevaluate the tradition and purpose of our baptism. That it's not the main thing, but it serves to facilitate the demonstration of the gospel message that Paul ordained that we keep in memory. Oh, Father, we pray that we would go back to our apostles' doctrine to emphasize what he emphasized, to perform such baptisms according as he did it, illustrative of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Help us to keep the main thing the main thing, and water baptism is not it. It's not baptism. It's to preach the gospel. Tonight, Father, I pray that, that the truths that we receive from your word this evening would simply burn in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen and Amen. So thank you very much for listening. We hope to catch you again in our future broadcasts. On Monday, we have the precepts from the Proverbs. On Thursday, we have the Pauline Pastorate online Bible study on the book of First Timothy. And hope to catch you again next Saturday for another session of the Comfort Verses in Context. So thank you very much for listening. The Lord bless you.